Thanks for joining us uh, for this, the penultimate session in this video series. In the last video post, we discussed how to put, identify potential solutions using action role mining, and then used uplift modeling to identify the subset of cases which will benefit or be uplifted the most for the solution or treatment. In this session, we'll discuss how to evaluate an uplift model to determine its fitness for purpose. Let's start uh, by reminding ourselves where we are in our journey. Uh, this is the uh, fifth and sixth stage of a six step uh, diagnostic process mining workflow. We revisit the problem statement. Uh, we're using a real life data set from the Business Process Intelligence uh, 17 Challenge, uh, which captures the loan process for a Dutch financial service institution. And throughout this series, we've used that data set to illustrate the causal inference techniques uh, we've been discussing. The problem we're focusing on is lower than expected acceptance rates. And we discovered a number of action rules from our data, which when followed, would change the outcome from an undesirable to a desirable one. In other words, it would change the outcome from the customer declining the offer to accepting it. That's one of the action rules on the screen. And it basically reads, for customers with a credit score of zero, extending their pay payback period from 120 to 126 months uh, would increase the chances that they would accept the offer. We also quantified that action rule with the support, the confidence, and the uplift, as you can see on the screen. We then created an uplift model for this rule. As you may recall, we mentioned that action rules are associational and uplift trees enable us to derive causal insights. As you can see from this uplift tree, customers with that specific attribute within that range of withdrawal amount or, or offered amount are more likely to accept if we intervene in this specific manner. And this enables us to intervene in a more targeted fashion, targeting customers who are more likely to respond positively to our intervention. The question is, how do we know whether this uplift model is any good or not? In other words, how do we assess its validity? We're going to evaluate our uplift model using a Kini curve and score. Let's briefly explain what this is and how it is derived. The Kinecog shows the incremental uplift gain against the percentage of people targeted by an intervention. Let's break this down further. On the vertical axis, we have the incremental uplift gain. Think of this as the cumulative increase in uplift as a result of our intervention. On the horizontal axis, we have the percentage of uh, the population who have been treated. We then take each customer in our data set and predict their uplift based on their conditional average treatment effect. Conditional average treatment effect was explained in greater detail in the previous post. We order the cumulative gain from largest to smallest and then plot it. To enable us to make sense of the shape of the curve, it's useful to understand that each customer falls into one of four quadrants based on their response to our intervention. The persuadables who would not have accepted the offer, uh, but do so because of our intervention. The straw things, those who would have accepted the offer, regardless of whether we intervened or not. The lost causes, those who would not have accepted the offer, regardless of whether we intervened or not. And then the do not disturb, those who would have accepted, but don't or are less likely to because of an intervention. In other words, our intervention has had 
a negative effect. As we plot these on the graph, we notice that the first set of customers who show up are those with a positive uplift, uplift score. Do you remember what those are? Yes, they're the persuadables. They're the ones that we are really interested in identifying as they respond positively to our intervention. However, as we increase the percentage of customers targeted, we run out of persuadables and come to those for whom intervening uh, will not make a blind bit of difference. The sure things are who will have accepted, even if we didn't do anything, and the lost causes, they will not accept despite our intervention. For this group, there is no uplift gain or loss, but given that intervention has a cost, it's a waste of our time and effort. Finally, we come to those customers with a negative uplift, those, for, those customers for whom our intervention results in an opposite effect to that we intended. Perhaps extending their payback period annoyed them, and now they're less likely to accept compared to if there was no intervention. We definitely want to avoid uh, intervening with those. Not only do we incur implementation cost and effort, we also exacerbate the problem. We work against our goal. This straight line uh, at an angle is when we randomly treat customers without regard for uplift. Now, in an ideal world, a good uplift model will help you focus on the persuadables and ignore the sure things the loss causes and the do not disturb. The Kinney uh, curve can be summarized in a Kinney score or coefficient, which is the difference in the area between the uh, straight line, the random treatment line, and a Kinney curve. And a Kinney score close to one represents a good performance of the uplift model, and a Kinney score closer to zero, a worse one. Here is the Kinney curve for the uplift model uh, that we've been looking at for our prescribed intervention that is extending the payback period uh, from 120 months to 126 months for customers with a credit score of zero, and that is the Kinney score. Ideally, we'd we'll have liked it to be closer to uh, one. Having said that, it enables us to identify that stop to the customers who benefit the most from our intervention. Uh, we can also add the cost of intervention to our uplift model to enable us perform a cost benefit analysis. One final thing to mention about this, uh, because it's a prediction problem, we're using the predicted uplift score for each case or each uh, customer, it's recommended that we split the data into a training set which we use to build a model, then use a test set to predict the uplift. It is this predicted uplift that we use to create our clinic uh, We do this to prevent overfitting. Now, having identified and validated our interventions, we now need to address implementing the solutions. You'll notice that we had data on the solutions or interventions we've explored. That's a good place to start looking for appropriate solutions. And where we identify those interventions with adequate uplift, well, implementation is simply uh, or typically a matter of more targeted intervention. Uh, our implementation would include user training, uh, perhaps an update of key operating uh, standards. We could also update our systems to assist users make more targeted uh, interventions. Where interventions with an adequate uplift cannot be identified from existing data, then there will be a need to generate and assess suitable solutions. Uh, my recommendation will be to pilot those solutions prior to a wider rollout and to run them in parallel with your status quo. If feasible, uh, ensure a random assignment of cases to the status quo and to your intervention. I'll also recommend agreeing a target, set the bars aware for the desired treatment effect you want this intervention to meet. That will enable us to check if our intervention is having the desired effect, and if not, it will enable us to fail faster. 
And at the end of the pilot period, we assess the effect of this intervention using the techniques we've discussed earlier. If it surpasses the target, then we implement a wider rollout. If it doesn't, we either abandon or we decline. So for the problem we've looked at so far in this series, we've taken a reactive view. We've looking to stop problems that have already occurred in the past from reoccurring in the future. In the final video post in this series, we'll be looking at prescriptive process monitoring, an approach which takes a proactive view by predicting cases or process instances that are likely to be problematic and then suggesting remedial actions to prevent the problem from occurring. Hope you'll join me for that session.